Hello, and thank you so much for joining me in today's video. As promised earlier in the month of December, I am ready to start talking about synchronicity experiences, the spiritual path, and my personal journey a little bit more than I have over the last few years. If you're one of my regular viewers, or if you're returning to my channel after seeing one of my videos before, welcome and thank you so much for coming back. If you're new here, welcome! My name is Sarah and I talk about everything from surviving a cult and exposing the crimes of said cult to tarot card readings and crystal healing and starseed awakenings and Hinduism and all that kind of good stuff. It's a little eclectic, but I think we can never put ourselves in a box or limit ourselves to just one niche or one topic. So you can expect me to be kind of all over the place. Anyhow, in a video that I made very recently, I declared that I'm ready to start talking about spirituality again. And so before I post the pick a card reading for January of 2023, I wanted to make good on that promise and talk about a synchronicity that I experienced earlier this year that for me sums up my 2022 journey. It's pretty much the coolest thing that happened to me creatively in 2022. So of course, Happy New Year! <laughs> if you're seeing this video shortly after I upload it, that means you're watching this either on New Year's Eve or on New Year's Day, and it's such an exciting time because New Year's always comes with new energies. And if you're like me and you follow the kind of societally prescribed tradition of setting a New Year's resolution, then this time of year can be very exciting when it comes to manifestation. If you feel overwhelmed or anxious at the idea of setting a New Year's resolution because sometimes they can be hard to stick to or maybe in past years you set a resolution for yourself and it just didn't come to fruition or for whatever reason you fell out of the habit that you thought you were going to maintain, I feel you, that's happened to me too. And one thing that I've come to realize is that we can never let our past failures prevent us from putting ourselves out there and trying something new and striving for future successes. The topic of this video is all about that, trusting our intuition, jumping into something new, even if in the past we haven't succeeded when we've tried new things. And this is kind of a message that came out in the tarot reading that I did for us as a collective for this month. And so full disclosure, I filmed the tarot reading video yesterday, even though this video is going to be uploaded before that one. So spoiler alert, one of the messages is don't let your past hold you back from trying something new. And the new thing that I'm trying or the resolution I've set for myself for 2023 is to finally get on TikTok, start doing shorter video content pieces, so maybe some YouTube shorts, some Instagram stories, some TikToks, where I delve into tarot and crystal healing more fully than I've allowed myself to explore it in YouTube videos. So this might be repetitive if you're one of my regular viewers, but one of the reasons why I didn't expand on my love for crystals and crystal healing on a regular basis, like sometimes I would make a Moldavite video and then I would go months or even a year without talking about crystals again, or I would do my monthly pick a card readings, but I wouldn't really talk about how tarot has guided and inspired and enriched my own life. Part of the reason for that is that I've had kind of an up and down journey with regards to judging my spiritual path after escaping the cult of a fraud who calls himself Nityananda. So when I left that cult, I got really into psychology 
And by that, I mean, I started reading books written by psychologists about mind control and how the human brain can be kind of infiltrated by external ideas that create an off balance or a dependency on a system, a religion, a doctrine, a leader, and how a lot of the times the people who are susceptible to that are also inclined towards what psychology calls magical thinking. And magical thinking is where we might be, for example, prone to connect things that are unrelated and in those coincidences we see synchronicities. So magical thinking can be seeing the numbers 1111 and feeling, wow, this is a sign from the universe. Magical thinking can also be superstition. So if you see something that you think is a bad omen, having a negative self-fulfilling prophecy where suddenly you feel like something is set up to cause you harm. And of course, those of us on the spiritual path, we are by nature magical thinkers. So I started to get very, very down on myself thinking, my God, the reason I got sucked into a cult is because I am mentally predisposed towards reading into things, seeing signs, seeing synchronicities, analyzing what my dreams mean, analyzing what the message from the universe is if a particular bird lands on my balcony and sings a little tune. So I started to feel like perhaps when I feel synchronicities are happening and when I have channeled messages come to me and when magical things transpire, maybe I should keep that to myself lest I appear crazy. So the funny thing is, even knowing that psychology would label my way of thinking disordered or consider it to be magical thinking, I was never able to completely let go of my belief in crystals and tarot and oracle cards and the starseed phenomenon and channeled messages from higher realms because quite frankly, I've had personal experiences with all of these things and my own inner truth was stronger than the atheistic agenda that I see coming from the scientific community. Now, I just want to mention here the psychological books that I read. Why did I fumble that word? Psychological. The psychological books that I read about cult survival have been extremely helpful in letting go of the attachment to the problematic ways of thinking that were instilled in the cult that I escaped. It's just that they go a little bit too far when they start to negate any form of spiritual joy that we have in life. So I don't mean in any way whatsoever to say spiritual people are right and atheists are wrong or that everybody should live the way I'm living. All I mean to say is that for me personally, spirituality adds color and joy and excitement to my life. This is how I choose to believe. This is how I choose to live. And I think it's wonderful. So anyway, as per usual, I gave kind of too much information and a long-winded introduction to this video, but I kind of wanted to just mention that at the get-go so that you can understand why when this particular synchronicity happened to me, I didn't immediately film a video. I kind of waited until the time felt right to start talking about this again. And the reason that time is now is that, as I said in my recent video about let's get spiritual again, I finally feel an inner resolution with my self-judgment. I finally feel like it's okay to both talk about cult survival and the importance of self-sovereignty and the importance of critical thinking and also believe in some things that are kind of out there. So one of the things that I did in 2022 that's kind of cool is that I was on Dr. Phil. He did an episode about cults and he interviewed me about my personal cult experience. And one of the things that he said when he introduced that topic, I don't remember whether this made it into the final cut of that episode or if this is something that they edited out, but either way, it's something that really, really, really 
gave me that permission slip to just be myself. He said, red flags are when somebody with authority over you, or, or a red flag is when somebody in a religious system or a kooky kind of counterculture movement tries to exert authority over you in a way that impedes your free will and self-sovereignty. And this is me paraphrasing, by the way. These are not his exact words, so don't quote me on this. But he said, it's not wrong to have strange beliefs or to do a practice that's different from what everybody else does. He said, a cult is not a group of people who believe in weird things. A cult is when a group of people who believe in anything start to control the lives of its members and make it so that you're not allowed to differ from the opinions of a leader. And so just hearing that, that wait a minute, yeah, it's not culty to believe in something that's different from what others believe in. In fact, if we start to censor our personal beliefs in order to be more palatable to the mainstream, are we not then in the cult of mainstream society? Anyway, I don't mean to go down a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories or stuff like that. We'll save that for a future video maybe. But I just mean to say, like, how cool is it that, yeah, if we believe something different from what others believe, that's our personal truth. We have the right to hold on to that belief. We have the responsibility to ourselves to be excited about what we believe in. And in fact, it might be a disservice to the world to stop ourselves from talking about what we truly believe because maybe the fact that we're down here living this life believing those things means this is something we're meant to bring in to the earth reality so anyway i'm excited to start bringing my authentic spiritual maybe crazy maybe divine who knows it's not up to me to judge what i am it's just up to me to be what i am and i hope you can relate to that too. Like, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. It's not up to us to interpret or analyze or put into a category what we are. It's just up to us to be what we are. And then those who resonated, who vibe with us are going to connect. And those who feel repelled by that, like they don't have to watch, they don't have to subscribe, they don't have to follow, they can move on. There are enough content creators on YouTube right now and in the world right now that nobody has to listen to anybody. We can see YouTube as like a buffet of content and pick what we want. So if you're into the stuff I'm into, I'm just grateful that you're joining me here on this journey. Okay, 13 minutes in, I'm finally ready to tell you about the synchronicity that happened that really helped me get excited about the work I'm doing in 2022. So if you are somebody who's checked out my Etsy shop or who follows me on Instagram, you will have seen that I made a bunch of little sculptural jewelry pieces over the past couple of years that include little sculpted faces with crystals, and piles of hand sculpted little rocks that I've called floating rock gardens. And I've also made some pieces that include little faces that I refer to as my ancient shamans. So these little faces, I sculpt them intuitively. Sometimes I add little dots or almost like Star Trekian alien forehead shapes. Like I just have fun with that stuff and mix them with crystals, of course, because that's what I'm into. This one's perhaps my favorite of all. I call it the Shaman's Light because there's the Shaman here crowned by rainbow obsidian with a perfect little miniature Lemurian quartz and an celestial quartz on the back. Anyway, while I was working on these pieces earlier this year, I decided to call the line talismans from the ancient future this one especially this one to me oh, it just reminds me of lord shiva the face on each side almost a lingam like or a z bead shaped bead i love hand sculpting these pieces they're a lot of fun but anyway 
For Christmas last year, one of my aunties gave me a book about the history of jewelry, and it's a museum um, retrospective showing all the pieces of ancient jewelry in, an, in a museum collection. And it kind of delves into the history of jewelry design through an archeological lens. So the cultural dynamics that gave rise to different shapes of beads and different styles of gold granulation and what talismanic properties ancient peoples in different parts of the world attributed to different jewelry designs. And so I got really fascinated by and I started nerding out over the history of jewelry. So I've always been into crystal healing and I've always been aesthetically drawn to blingy things and shiny things. Like you can probably tell just by the jewelry that I wear in my videos, like I'm a jewelry girl. But I finally got really into the historical context behind jewelry. And I, when I was looking at the jewelry designs from the Hellenistic period and the ancient Roman period, like Greek and Roman designs, there was something so modern in a lot of the gold work, like big statement earrings with drippy bits hanging from them and little faces. And it was like, whoa, I thought I had innovated something new by designing little sculpted faces in my jewelry. But what I felt was new in my personal discovery of design was actually something extremely ancient. And then I contemplated on the fact that when those ancient jewelry designers made those pieces of jewelry a long, long time ago, thousands of years ago, they wouldn't have fathomed, like it, it was not part of their goal in the design process, that one day this piece is going to be part of a curated collection in a museum and it's going to make it into a coffee table book about jewelry and future generations will be inspired by it. They were just making jewelry for the royals or for their clients or to adorn deities and temples. They weren't thinking about the long-term lifespan of these pieces they made. And so I started to think of it as talismans for the ancient future. Like this was made in ancient times, but it's going to survive into future times. And we don't own anything. We are just the custodians over whatever matter comes into what we perceive to be our possession in the time being. We are borrowing it from our descendants, not inheriting it from our ancestors. We're guardians who are here to pass these things on. And as I was contemplating on that, I decided to name my shamanic face collection Talismans from the Ancient Future. The name just kind of came to me as I was thinking about this amazing lineage of jewelry design and sacred, spiritual, physical things. It's also interesting, just as a little side note, how a lot of people think materialism is inherently wrong or is inherently evil. And while I definitely feel that the, you know, financial system in which we live, this capitalistic society can be very detrimental towards the quality of life. Like, I think it's absolutely bullshit that people who get sick have to pay for medical treatment. I think it's ridiculous that for example, not everyone has universal health care. Um, I think a lot of things are ridiculous, like we have to pay for food, clothing, shelter, basic necessities. I think that should be like baseline provided. Don't come at me. I am a little bit socialistic. I do lean pretty far left. Um, but when it comes to luxury goods, I do feel that there needs to be some kind of energy exchange. Like if somebody develops a skill, develops a talent, does something really unique, I wish money didn't have to be the thing. I wish we could have a barter society where, anyway, like I said, that's, that's a whole other side topic. But what I meant to get at was, I think it's funny how a lot of people who are on the spiritual journey start to shun material possessions. And I have personally done this. So the cult that I had joined 
I went to the extreme level within that cult of taking what's called sannyas, literally renouncing the material world, donning the saffron robes of a Hindu nun, and living with a minimal possessions, which in Sanskrit is called aparigraha, living with a minimal of things. And what's interesting is that among those minimal possessions we were allowed to own was sacred jewelry. Now, this could be because it was a cult, but one thing that I noticed in my travels around India, every sannyasi I encountered, no matter the tradition, no matter who was their guru, no matter which lineage they fell into, all of them had a few very powerful spiritual items that they carried, including prayer beads, including a sacred mala, including something that they could wear that represented their spiritual path and their personal spiritual practice. A lot of times it was Rudraksha seeds, if like me, they were devotees of Lord Shiva. Sometimes it would be sandalwood beads, if they're Vaishnavites, or Tulsi, if they're Vaishnavites in the path of Lord Vishnu. But, or clear crystal, if they're Shaktas, worshippers of the goddess Devi. But what I found fascinating is that even those who renounce materiality, renounce money, renounce capitalism, renounce this faulty attribution that designer labels or brand names determine the value of the person wearing them. Like, oh, I hate the fact that a lot of people think the clothes make the man. Fuck that shit. Like, no. Wear what you want. I don't mean to fashion shame anybody. I like to dress nicely too, but those things do not define us. However, in certain pieces of spiritual jewelry, that talismanic quality or amuletic property of the jewelry we wear, whether it's lapis lazuli to awaken our third eyes or turquoise for the throat chakra and communication or like little sculpted faces, so the earrings I chose to wear today are also from my Talismans from the Ancient Future collection with Tektite, which is an impact glass made out of meteoric rock. Anyway, it's like the clothes we wear, I, I don't really care about clothes. I'm a jewelry person. But it's interesting that in religious society, even those who renounce physical material wealth will continue to utilize certain sacred items, singing bowls in the Buddhist world. And these are not just boring looking brass bowls with wooden sticks. Some of them are very sculptural, very beautiful. In a lot of traditions, the temples and the churches are designed with arche or architectural beauty and splendor. And so the material world is spiritual can be spiritual if spiritual principles underlie the design and the intention behind the material things. Look at visionary artists who make visionary artwork. They might be using the same types of paints and canvases and brushes as pop artists or commercial artists, but the energy that they're channeling into their art is coming from a higher dimensional realm and therefore it radiates something that's elevating to our frequency. And this brings us to finally the synchronicity I wanted to share with you. So one of my dear friends gifted me my absolute all time favorite deck of Oracle cards, which is called the Beyond Lemuria Oracle. You'll notice I use these a lot in my monthly tarot readings and I'll start sharing more of these on TikTok as my card of the day. But when he sent these to me, the first day I received them before opening the guidebook or picking a rent, like before, you know, trying to memorize the meanings of each card, I just shuffled the deck and pulled one at random, which I like to do whenever I get a new deck. And the absolute first card ever that I drew from this set of Oracle cards is called Our Ancient Future. And I was just blown away, first and foremost, by the beauty of the design in this card. Like, look at the light codes. 
that are streaming from the face of this beautiful mermaid goddess figure. Like, oh, everything about this image is just gorgeous. Um, the artist has done a splendid job in communicating spiritual feelings in a visual art form. But of course, the words are what struck me so profoundly. I had literally just made a post about my new jewelry design that I call talismans from our ancient future. And within a week of that, get a new deck of oracle cards. They're stunningly beautiful. And the very first one I pull is called our ancient future. So for me, that was the universe, that was existence. Here's where my magical thinking comes in. <laughs> so to a psychologist who is atheistic, this might seem like, oh, here we go again. Sarah's drawing parallels where there are only coincidences. But to those of us who are more mystically inclined, this is what I mean when I say, when we align to our true path, the universe will show us signs to confirm that we are in the right place at the right time, moving in the right direction. And so as a little New Year's message, I would like to read for you the meaning that the artist Izzy Ivy gives to the card, Our Ancient Future. Because for me, this sums up what 2022 was all about. And of course, we've each led different lives. We've all had a different year that we're moving out of, but there might be something in here that resonates with you too. So I'm setting a strong intention to internalize this message and carry it forward into 2023. So the message, wisdom from indigenous peoples ancestors holding the keys for the future, ancient remembering, bloodlines, how the past affects the future, a time to step up, timeless power symbols, and activations for power shifts. And she says, right now, the legends of the Lemurian civilization feel important as the wisdom from this ancient time is relevant. The fall of the Lemuria Sorry, the fall of Lemuria alerts us to the possibility that humanity may face if we live without respect for the earth. An ancient remembering is emerging. Many of the seed crystals and the knowledge they are imbued with are becoming unearthed. Remember, my favorite of these talismans is the one with the little Lemurian seed crystal. It is said that the Lemurians who survived the fall traveled the planet and ended up in places where inspiring indigenous knowledge far outweighs what modern Western minds have come to prioritize. The ancient Egyptians, Mayans, Inca, Tibetans, Maoris, indigenous Australians, and Hopi are examples. These ancient knowledge keepers of earth and ethers have been holding the key for a new world. We are being called back to our roots to acknowledge the infinite wisdom available when we drop out to our knees in humble receptivity. To move gracefully forward, we must first stand in our power for the places, ethics, and conservation of what matters most. When we heal ourselves, we often heal our ancestors also. So ancestral healing is something really profound that happens when we identify something of a shadow in our lives, when we do shadow work and look at our sometimes unconscious behavior patterns or self-limiting beliefs or times when we self-sabotage and we can let go of those by bringing awareness into the shadows. It's like shining light in the darkness. And what happens if you shine light on a shadow? Poof, it disappears, right? So it's really cool. One thing I've read in a lot of traditions, including the Vedic tradition that continues to inspire me, like for the record, even though the cult I was in portrayed itself to be a Hindu organization, I have no animosity towards the sacred Sanatana Dharma tradition. I still consider myself, if I had to pick a religion, it would be Hinduism. I feel more spiritual than religious, but Hinduism, for me, that's where it's at. And they talk about when somebody renounces the constraints of the material world, when somebody becomes a sannyasi, 
and chooses to live for enlightenment rather than for name and fame or material acquisition or sexual fulfillment. When our goals are higher goals rather than low frequency, low density goals, not only do we achieve our spiritual ambition, not only do we get enlightened, but also seven generations back in our family tree and seven generations forward. So this means aunts and uncles, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents going back seven generations and also children if we have them or nieces and nephews and cousins. Like it's not just a, a an up and down stream, it's a tree so it branches out. They also accelerate on their spiritual paths too. Everybody levels up when we level up and that's what ancestral healing is all about. So if you ever feel like you don't want to become too spiritual or you will become unrelatable to your family or you know you don't want to leave anybody behind just remember we are all connected you're not going to be leaving anybody behind you'll be pulling them up with you so do it <laughs> anyway <clears throat> you see ivy continues as illuminated beings ready to make a change in the collective consciousness we can sometimes take on what seems like more than our fair share of karma we may be clearing some of the wounds from our ancestors. With this in mind, we can ease through the waves, allowing guidance and empowered perspective to lead us to the greatest good. And the divinatory meaning, this card is imbued with activations for a new paradigm. I'm sorry, I should have been holding it as I read this. You are now being showered with blessings in preparation for a transformation. It may be turbulent at times, but you will grow and heal through the coming journey. Partake in activities that help you drop into a meditative state as often as possible. Use clearing tools to raise your vibration and don't get caught up on the destination. Focus on the journey and experience. You can navigate a situation you have no experience with by being truly present. Integrity and intuition will be your guide. So when she says use clearing tools, you might be wondering what are those if you're new to the spiritual journey. Clearing tools include incense and palo santo for smudging or sage for smudging your environment. They can include crystal wands, um, especially for clearing black stones like obsidian, black tourmaline, black tektite. An energy tool is literally anything that you put some kind of a ritualistic use into, playing a singing bowl, ringing a bell, hitting a gong. All of these are things that clear our energetic space and help bring us into the present moment. So with that said, the present moment is a time of transformation, not only on New Year's Eve, but always in any given moment, we have a choice of what we're going to do next, of how we're going to see ourselves and the world, of how we're going to use and integrate and possibly transmute our past experiences, who we want to be and how we want to be that. So I wish you nothing but love, light, creative fulfillment, many blessings, and so much joy in this year to come and always and forever. And I thank you so much for joining me on my journey. And if you'd like to pick up your own piece of ancient future and talismanic crystal creative sculptural art that you can also wear as jewelry and use as, as an energy tool. By the way, I made this one specifically as not only a pendant that of course you can wear. It has a loop so you can hang it and wear it like this. Um, but I also made it to be an energy tool, so it's a mini wand. You can definitely use that as a little energy directing wand. Anyway, I'll put a link to my Etsy shop, The Art of Gems, in the video description below. And as my gift to you, my dear viewer, you can take 11% off by using the very synchronous repeat number coupon code 1111, spelled out E L E V E N and then the number is one, one. And of course I'll put that in the video description as well. But thank you so much for joining me. Oh, and the whole reason for this video, since I set the intention to start going on TikTok, I've decided my username there, 
and I decided this months back but then just didn't do anything with it. My username is going to be Ancient Future Priestess because one of my goals here spiritually is to bring in this transformational energy, bringing the ancient past into the present, calling in our future, understanding that like waves in the ocean, no wave is separate from the ocean. Each wave is just a part of that ocean moving upwards. That's the present moment. It's not, we're not separate from who we were in the past or who we're becoming in the future or the soul's journey from past lives into future expressions. We're just like a wave within the ocean of our pure consciousness, each one connected to each other. Let that be my final message for this video before I talk for another hour. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. So much love to you. Happy New Year. And we'll see you in the next video.